come now to Proverbs chapter 19. And we come to a new topic that Proverbs has not addressed yet until now. Remember that Proverbs is God's wisdom for life. The Hebrew word for wisdom is the word skill. How do you live your life with skill? Now, tonight, the broad topic here is discussing marriage. And it's talking in particular tonight about one member of the marital relationship. Notice with me in Proverbs chapter 19 in verse 13. Now remember before we read this verse that the characteristic of Hebrew poetry is parallelism, which means, does anyone remember what that means? I've told you in the past what it means. Hebrew parallelism does one of two things. They either contrast or they like expand on That's right. Okay. So tell me, I'm going to read this verse and tell me if it's contrasting or expanding. Proverbs 19 verse 13 says, A foolish son is ruined to his father and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. So parallel, is this a contrast or is this expanding? expanding. It's expanding. It's talking about in, these, in this verse two things that destroy a home. Foolishness and strife. It says here that just like a foolish son is ruined to his father, a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. The, the Hebrew word for quarreling here is a word that's closely related to the idea of judging. In other words, you're talking about a woman who has a judgmental, critical spirit. And just like a foolish son will ruin a home, so will a wife with this spirit. The continual dripping makes everyone miserable. It's a perpetual annoyance. You know, can you imagine being, and of course in the ancient world, I can imagine in, in the way those houses were constructed, you've got a drip in the house, and it's dripping, I'm sure, in those ancient worlds onto the floor, and you're sitting in the room. Like today in our modern world with our roof, a lot of times, unless you've got a really bad roof, you're going to be protected from that. But in the ancient world, it'd be so easy for the rain to filter, to seep into the house, and you can imagine sitting there, and it just keeps on coming and keep on coming. And I have a question for you guys. What happens to a roof that's leaky eventually? If you don't fix it, it's going to fall through. It's going to collapse. Okay, and the scripture says here that a wife with a judgmental, critical spirit, just like a foolish son, can destroy a home. You know, one of the things that can ruin a marriage is a contentious wife. The drip, drip, drip of arguing, complaining, criticizing. Wives play a huge role in the happiness of their home. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, verse 1, if you turn back there, Proverbs 14, verse 1, the wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. A wife can destroy her own home by an argumentative, complaining, critical spirit. The Bible also addresses this in four other places in Proverbs. If you turn there with me, Proverbs 21, verse 9. Proverbs 21, verse 9 says, It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. A woman who has this critical, contentious spirit. It would be better for you to live somewhere, just rent the roof of someone's house all by yourself, than to have the whole house and live in it with a contentious, argumentative, critical, complaining woman. Verse 19 says, It is better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. The word fretful here is angry. 
So you, ha you, have, you have a woman here who is characterized by an argumentative, critical, complaining, contentious spirit. And it is in the process of destroying this home, but in this case, it, it's enlarged on in verse 19. She's not only quarrelsome, but she's also angry. And the Lord says, it'd be better for you to live all by yourself in the desert than to live in a house like that. Now, remember, who is... Proverbs 1 tells us the original audience of Proverbs. and the, Specifically, the Holy Spirit mentions there's a certain category of person that Proverbs is written to. Now, it applies to all of us. We're going to learn from this tonight. But who is the intended specific audience that Proverbs 1 mentions in the early verses? People that are beginning life. People that are just, you know, they're just going to start making these kinds of choices. So in other words, part of what God is saying is here is if you're wise, you will avoid marrying a woman like this. If you're a young man and you find that you're already in this, it's becoming clear to you that you're dealing with a person with a complaining, argumentative, critical spirit, contentious, it would be much wiser for you to go live by yourself in the desert. Don't get into that thing. Fast forward to Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 24. Proverbs 25 and verse 24, it is better again to live in a corner of the house top than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. And then notice chapter 27 verses 15 and 16. Chapter 27, verses 15 and 16. By the way, the verses we're reading should tell a wife, by the way, if you find that your husband is avoiding you, there could be a reason. Notice Proverbs 27, verse 15. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. To restrain her is to restrain the wind. Anyone ever try to do that? I'm going to stop the wind. Grab it with your hands. Can you do that? No, you, you can't control it. Or, he says, or to grasp oil in one's hand. Try to do that. Try to catch oil. I'm not lying at all. What's going to happen? You can't do it. You can't restrain. And oftentimes, this means that what's happening at home is happening other places too. You can't restrain it. That spirit she has is manifesting itself not only in your home, but in other places. Hey, I want to ask a question to all of our wives and ladies that want to be wives. Do you lighten the spirit of your husband or do you quench it? There's a famous story. It's quite a notorious story actually here in Providence. I can't believe this has actually happened. Back in 1875, there was a businessman who built on the east side of Providence. He built a brand new building in the city. Get this for a million dollars in 1875. So this is a very ornate building. And the key piece of this building was an arch. And Isaac Ladd said this iron arch was especially in honor of his wife. He did it especially for her. You know what's amazing, guys? They said that when his wife saw the arch, she thought it was disgusting. She thought it was horrible. Huh. Yep. Wow. She criticized it, criticized him. Now, this is unbelievable. This, is, this literally happened. They said that he was so heartbroken about her response to this gift, it sent him in a tailspin, and within three years, he committed suicide. Aww. Now, here's what's amazing. Do you know that that archway sat on the east side of Providence all the way until 1971? In 1971, Bryan College used to be up on the east side of Providence. Does anyone remember when it was there? Bryan was on the east side. Well, in 1971, a very famous alumni, alumnus of Bryant, gave 400 acres of land to his alma mater to start a brand new university in Smithfield. He gave his 400 acres to him. You guys might have heard of him. His name was Earl Tupper, the founder of Tupperware. 
he donated 400 acres of land to Bryant College and they started Bryant University in Smithfield. Wow. Guess what guys, do you know to this day, the arch that Isaac Ladd built for his wife is in the center of the campus of Bryant. And you know that Bryant has a, a tradition to this day. That is, no student at Bryant University walks under that arch until they graduate, because it's considered bad luck. So they say that right now, if you were to go on campus, the grass underneath that arch is like perfectly green, all around it's all worn out. <laughs> People only walk under it when they graduate, because it has this kind of bad luck type of situation. But that is an extreme example of how a wife can quench the spirit, destroy the spirit of her husband. You know, wives, it is, you know, obviously the Lord brings us up because there actually are women like this. And so the, I have a question for those who are wives and want to be wives. Are you a ray of sunshine in your home or are you a rain cloud? You know, are you the person you walk in the room and here comes the cloud? Or are you a person that when you walk in the room, here comes the sunshine? And everyone feels it. You know, the wife has such a ability to control the atmosphere of the home. And you know something, everybody? A woman that fears the Lord will not behave in this way. A woman who properly esteems the Lord in her life will not have a contentious, argumentative, critical, complaining spirit. She won't. In fact, Proverbs 31 describes the excellent wife. And notice what it says about her in chapter 31 and verse 26. Proverbs 31 and verse 26 what does it say about this woman? When she opens her mouth, what is the characteristic of it? She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. The woman who is like this, when she speaks, whether it's at home or somewhere else, it's marked by kindness. It's not marked by critical, complaining, contention, and so on. And we have a great example of this, by the way, in Abraham's wife. And I want you to turn there with me in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. The Lord talks about this spirit that is a beautiful one in his eyes. It says here in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 1, Likewise, wives... Be subject to your own husbands, have a spirit of submission there to willingly surrender, to follow his leadership. So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one to the Lord without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. The guy is so blessed being in the presence of his believing wife. You know, it's interesting that 1 Corinthians 7 really addresses the topic, what do you do if you're a believing spouse and you live with an unbelieving spouse? What should you do? Now, I want to turn there for a second. We'll come back to 1 Peter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 gives God's direct instruction concerning when you are faced with this situation in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 10. The Bible says here in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10, To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. In other words, this is something that the Lord has addressed. And that is this, the wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord. In other words, the Lord has not addressed this in the Gospels. I am now going to address a matter that's not previously been discussed in Scripture. Now, Paul is an inspiration. This is God's instruction, but it's never been dealt with before until now. That if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. 
If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Why? For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. In other words, the believing spouse has a sanctifying influence on the unbelieving spouse just by being there. The very fact that they're watching you follow Jesus, the very fact that you're displaying in a, that in a, a challenging circumstance a, a beautiful spirit, in your case as the wife in tonight's context, this has a sanctifying influence on your husband. That's why you should remain. For the unbelieving husband, again, is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. In some special way, your children experience a sanctifying influence of a believing parent. Now, of course, your children are going to themselves have to come to believe the gospel themselves, but they are experiencing through a Christian parent the holy influence of the Lord, just like your spouses. But if the unbelieving partner separates, verse 15, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. If you're in a marriage where you have an unbelieving spouse, and the unbelieving spouse says, I don't want to be in this marriage anymore. I want a divorce. Then the Bible says the believing spouse is not enslaved. Then let them go in peace. Okay, but the believing spouse is to never prompt that. If the unbelieving spouse does, God allows in that case for there to be a divorce. There are two cases that scripture allows in the case of adultery and in the case of desertion by the unbelieving spouse. But then it says in verse 16, how do you know, wife? And by the way, I just want to pause on this very briefly to say, wherever the scripture allows divorce, remarriage is assumed. If the Lord allows you, he allows those exceptions in those cases, would you be able to be remarried? That's assumed in scripture. And it says in verse 16, how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? You don't know what God's going to do. You don't know. So, God, your unbelieving spouse needs to see you live out the gospel. Now go back to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. It says here, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. In other words, obviously God is not forbidding for a woman to, to look beautiful, look nice. That's not the point here. The point that he's making is the focus that you need to have as a Christian wife is not the external but the internal. Let your adorning, the thing you are most concerned about being beautiful in, the hidden person of the heart, that's where God wants Christian wives to be looking. God, where is my heart? Is my heart beautiful in your sight? Not what is he doing? What is he like? What should he be doing? God's saying to the Christian wife, I want your, you look in the mirror, and what you're looking for is the beauty of the heart. God, is that happening in my life? And what does that beauty look like? It looks like this, a gentle and quiet spirit, which God says in his sight is very precious. Now, ladies, the scripture tells us that God greatly values in women this kind of a spirit. A gentle one that is quiet, that's reserved. That this in God's sight is a very precious thing. This is how the holy women 
who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. Now see, that's the big point, that phrase, they hoped in God. What is it that enables a woman to have a submissive, quiet, beautiful spirit? Because all her hope is in God. She is not placing her hope, I'm going to make this man be what I want him to be. Well, I'm, I have all, and, and, and of course the challenge there as a woman is that certainly God's desired the woman to th- want this relationship with her husband, of course. And the natural tendency is to look to that relationship and that man to meet that need. But the Bible says the thing that's driving a holy woman is her hope is in God. And because of that, that is what is causing this adorning, this beautiful heart in her, which causes her to submit to her own husband. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you you ladies, you are her children, you're Sarah's daughter, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. You know, I think that's one of the big challenges sometimes. You know, a lot of times you'll hear women say, you know, they're, they're upset, they're complaining, and they'll say, well, because he's not doing what he should do, I'm afraid about this, or someone's got to do it. And the Lord says to Christian women, I want you to really trust me about this, and I don't want you to be afraid. I just want you to focus on this beauty. Where is your heart? You know, a woman that fears the Lord is is not... The last thing she wants to do is destroy her own home through her spirit. You know, the Bible says to all Christians that let no corrupt communication. This is a type of communication that that erodes, that tears down. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up, that it may minister grace to those who hear. And how important it is that in a marriage that that is the law of kindness is on the wife's tongue, that the husband is being built up in the way she communicates. The Bible says to all Christians, do all things without murmuring and disputing, contending and arguing. How many things does God want us to do without griping, complaining and arguing? How many? He wants us to do them all. And we say, well, that person's frustrating me and they didn't, I didn't like the way they acted towards me, whatever it is. And the Lord's calling us all to say, okay, now I'm, I'm calling you to work out your salvation that I'm working in you. And one of the way it works out is in your attitude. The more that this, and by the way, guys, where does joy come from for every Christian and the Christian wife? It, it comes from the Spirit. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is joy. So the question we have to ask, and particularly tonight, the Lord's addressing wives. Contentious wives destroy homes. And the question that the Lord to the Christian wife is, are you yielded to God's Spirit in your life? The Lord has commanded you to be filled with the Spirit. Filled with it. Now, guys, how does that happen? It happens through immersion in the Word. It happens when you're on your knees. You're just filled. What, what, what did Jesus say? The words that I give you, they are spirit and they are life. Guys, I guarantee you, if you find any one of us with this kind of a spirit, this is not a person filled with God's spirit, if they have the spirit that's being described in Proverbs tonight, this destructive, critical But yet when I'm filled with God's word and it's washing over me, the Bible describes the spirit as kind of the washing and the renewing of the spirit that's all going on through the immersion in the word. The Bible says God prayed the night before he was crucified. He prayed for us all. Sanctify them in the truth, Father. Your word is truth. God, make their hearts more beautiful. Make them more holy through the truth. If you say right now... I, I, I'm concerned about my spirit and attitude. God says, "That's what, what do you need? You need more doses of the truth. You need more doses. You need to raise the dosage. Right now, you're taking 40 milligrams. Let's raise it up to 80. 
Let's spend more time. Let's let's really meditate in the Word. Let's start memorizing Scripture. We need heavy doses of the truth, no matter what it is. You know what I love, guys? No matter what uh, the struggle that we may be having, I love the invitation of Isaiah. I mentioned this on Sunday. I, I just now, this is currently one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. I love this passage. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Come, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Listen to me diligently and eat good food. Delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your, my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts and your thoughts. God says, you know what? Listen, I see you. I see Israel and Isaiah. I see your rebellion. And I'm, ask, I'm inviting you to come, come to the waters. Come get what you need. I know you, you, you have nothing to buy it with. You can't earn it. I'm inviting you to come and take it freely. Forsake your way. Forsake your thoughts. I will have compassion on you. I will abundantly forgive you. Come to the waters. And that's the Lord's answer for any wives that are struggling with this. Come to the waters. Forsake that way. Come be forgiven. And let the Lord give you rich food and give you a new way of being. Let's pray. Lord, how we pray that here in the congregation, we you know we've often prayed this, that as people come in among us here that know us in town or observe the life of this body, that they will see what a husband is and what a wife is and what a man is and what a woman is and what a family is and what a marriage is. They will learn by observing Christians. Lord, we pray for all the ladies in the congregation, those who are wives and those who desire to be. Lord, I pray that they would have the adorning of a beautiful heart that in your sight is of such great worth. Lord, I pray that they will be rays of sunshine in their homes, not rain clouds. Lord, use them to lighten the spirit and made by the very conduct of their lives and the spirit they possess, may they motivate their own husbands and children to want the same Lord that's made them so beautiful. We pray these things in your name. Amen.